Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, September the 26th. I'd like to start by thanking the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Um, if anybody wants to get a schedule of when we're on, send me an email. You can see my email address at the bottom of the uh, screen sometimes. Our first guest is John Farquharson, and we're going to be talking about the city election, which I just realized by the time this airs, it'll be very close to the city election. Well, on Thursday, well, this Saturday... When we'll is be, the election? Well, it's the 20th. Okay. So, <clears throat> pardon me, this Saturday, we're, uh, you know, this Saturday, we're three weeks out. So by the time this airs, two and a half weeks, right? Right. Almost to election day. Almost to election day. Yeah, so... we uh, for two weeks. As my, as my uh, what do you call it, the, my name tag underneath on the screen there shows, I'm with the VictoriaRecord.com. And, um, a website worth going to, VictoriaRecord.com. So I had an interesting experience last night. We're co-hosting a, um, a, Merrill, a Merrill debate uh, with the uh, North Park, I'm sorry, with the Fernwood Community Association. So a bunch of us got around and said, okay, we want to put together a, a, a forum that's going to engage, that people are going to want to come to. They're going to be engaged for 90 minutes, and they're going to leave with information that isn't available in any other format or any other form or anywhere else. So we're trying to structure that and be fair, be democratic, uh, and allow the participants to uh, be spontaneous. Our assumption was that if you had them interacting with one another a bit, not just sitting there answering, answering questions that they've rehearsed, you know, a hundred times, but being able to interact with one another to, uh, again, bring some spontaneity, some authenticity to the floor. So it was an interesting challenge to how, as to how to design that. And so this was last night? Last night. Okay, the, the, the event was last night. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, we're, the we're, I'm sorry, the, the event is the Sunday before the election. Oh, okay. And the date I should know. So it would be, uh, anyways, the Sunday before the, the election. It's going to be held at? at the uh, Fernwood uh, Community Center. So that's around the 13th? Yeah, anyways, check, check the victoriarecord.com yeah. yeah. for all the details. Yeah. And uh, what's the plan? Well, the plan is to uh, invite all the Merrill candidates. There's 10 of them. So one question that came up was, well, should we invite all of them, or should we in just invite those that have early on seemed to gain some traction with the, with, the, uh, with the voters? And that's a hard thing to determine. The Victoria Record has a, a bit of a poll going. We had four or 500 people uh, you know, cast a vote, and the, the leaders on this poll were basically Steve Hammond, <coughs> Lisa Helps, and McGuigan. They were the top three. How, how much, how, what was the votes for each well, of them? Well, Steve Hammond was, at last count, was out quite a bit, you know, two to one over, uh, over Mayor Helps, and then uh, McGuigan was in third place. And the uh, top write-in, people could also write in anybody that they felt uh, they wanted to, and, and Ben Isitt came up as one of the top write-ins, so that was interesting. He's not running, been a councillor for a long time. So he's uh, running as a councillor, but not, no, not I think. as a So we decided to invite, we're going to invite all 10 and uh, basically, again, allow them to have as much face-to-face uh, -face time as, as possible so that the audience stays engaged and uh, comes away with something. Uh, like stuff like that would be interesting if it was broadcast uh, or taped and shown sometime so people could see it because, I mean, I, I feel I'm not getting any information about anything from well, the, um, the media. The North Park Community Association hosted a, uh, a councillor's, what they called a bingo call. So there's 29 councillor candidates. That's quite a few. And how, how, do you, how do you structure an event that allows them, what, that's fair, and allows them all potential equal you know, airtime? So they had, I didn't go, but uh, my colleague uh, Sid did. And he said that basically they had uh, like a bingo machine, and all the all the councillor candidates had a, a bingo card, and if you know under the B six, if you had a B six, you got to answer a question, okay. which was randomly selected. So it was. Were there many people there? Um, uh, yes. I mean, again, it's available on videotape. Okay. Uh, and again, check out the Victoria Record, another plug. So uh, it's on at your website, Victoria Record. You can link into it through the website, okay. courtesy of the name of the production company, I forgot. 
So how many of these future forums will be uh, videotaped, I don't know, but uh, it does add a, a, you know, an opportunity for people to go and look at it after if they're unable to attend. I want to say what's wrong with the whole thing. Can I do that? All the forums? Not, not the forums. The forums are good. What's wrong with the whole concept of our city government? And to me, what a city government, what all governments should be doing is they should make sure that we get full information about the important issues that they're working on, that it should be accessible to us if we want it. And then they should, and they can do other things. They can have uh, focus groups, they can do polling, but they should find out what we want. Give us information, find out what we want, and then do your best to do it. Isn't, uh, to me, that's the way our governments should work. But it's like the complete opposite. It's like somebody else tells them what to do. And then they just hammer us until they get it through. It's, to me, our city government is the complete opposite of what Demo... And I don't want to pick on our city government. I just think it's, it's the way things are, but it's not working. We need a more democratic system. Well, uh, recently it came to light that the... I live in a neighborhood called Gonzales, and the Gonzales neighborhood plan has been under revision for, uh, whew, seems like going on a year, maybe more. And uh, what's now on the table is it's going to go to Council of the Whole this week, and then in two weeks it'll go to Council for a vote. And the vote is to basically uh, suspend the planning process. There doesn't seem to be any resolution of all of the outstanding issues that, the, uh, that citizens have brought forward to you know, uh, ask the planners about, ask the city about. And so they're apparently going to vote on whether or not to suspend the process indefinitely and go back to the plan that was uh, developed in 2002. So for me, that brings to mind the question of, well, a lot of money has been spent on this planning process. There's been an endless amount of, of so-called engagement. Uh, and at the end of all of that process and at the end of all of that information gathering and sharing, uh, we're at the point where they're going to suspend it indefinitely. So it brings to my, brings to my mind uh, how well designed is the planning process. Do you feel it, it, it has gotten somewhere? Do you feel that things, you know, the planning process has worked to well, move things we'll along and you what, could, you well, could make something of, out of it? Or? Well, in terms of listening, which was your concern, they don't listen, you could argue that they listen so well that they're going to suspend the process. And uh, which is one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it is to say, well, maybe you should have slowed down uh, and, uh, you know, gone in a different direction six months ago, eight months ago, ten months ago, a year ago. Why did it take them so long to finally listen and say, this isn't And we can working. talk about a much bigger process, which was the sewage treatment process that we're both, we were both involved in. Yeah. It's a billion dollar project, I'm sure, by the time it's finished, and uh, with very, very, I think, very, very little, little environmental benefit. Um, and that process, to me, was an absolute democratic disaster. I mean, the public, the public was not there to be listened to, even though it's supposed to be about us. We're supposed to be the citizens. But it was nothing to do with us. They, it, it was like the word was coming from above, namely the senior city staff and CRD staff. And then the council took that and made sure it happened. All, all our councils, the whole CRD, made sure it happened. And here in Victoria, we had four people on the sewage treatment thing. And the city was divided, I'd say, 50-50 at best, that we want this plan. But our four representatives always pushed it ahead. So, I mean, what's going on? Where, where's the listening? Where, where's, it, where's any democracy? That's my concern. Where is any democracy? Well, okay. I mean, again, the... Uh, and I'm not, I don't want to even fault them, but, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, you probably talked to Sid about this, but it's the... If in terms of being listened to, are they listening? So you look at all of the development applications that have come through uh, City Hall for the last four years, and then you look at the voting record of the uh, various councillors. Some councillors, uh, some people on council voted like 95% in favor of all developments, uh, down to some who voted 50-50, 50%. 50%.
So 50% they rejected and 50% they said okay. And these were major development these were big projects. Well, coming they were major. The we define major is as if six or more people turned out to to a public hearing to speak, that was major. Uh, major was also we bent the rules a bit and said major was also in terms of, you know, a 20-story building or a, a big buildings, okay? That might not have attracted a lot of people. So are, are the people who vote 50-50, are they listening more to the people who come out and uh, maybe speak against the project than those who basically vote 95% uh, in favor of all developments? And how now do you who, know? Who were the two that voted 95% in favor of, of development? I don't have the numbers in front of me. Basically, it was the mayor and, and uh, Councillor Alto. So Mayor Lisa were, Helps and Councillor were very high. They were over 90%. Yeah, I think it was over 90%. Down at the bottom uh, was uh, Councillor Young, basically 50-50. And I think Councillor Madoff was down in the sort of 55-45 uh, category. So are the ones that are voting in favor of every development uh, or just about every development not listening to the, the, the well, folks? I don't know. What do yeah. you think? Well, I, 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 that's a very good question. I don't know either, but it's a question that people we should are going to have to... Right. This is a big problem is that we don't even know. And well, in fact, no, no. if it wasn't for your website, no, no, but, even this information wouldn't well, here's, be public. My point is that even if you have their voting record in front of you, yeah. it's difficult to ascertain right an answer to your question, which is, you know, like, nobody listens. Well, the one I'm most involved in, we've only got two minutes left, is the big developments going on in the corner of Vancouver and Pandora. There's going to be a big uh, save on foods there with six, four or six stories of rental housing on oh, yeah. top. The neighborhood was totally the opposed to that. The old St. Andrew's School. The old St. Andrew's School. The neighborhood was totally opposed to that, and uh, I know Mayor Helps voted for it. I don't know about the others. I think it was a six, I think I think it was like a six to three vote. I forget you know uh, how it went, but uh, the uh, so were, were they again? I, the, the local neighbors seemed to be adamantly opposed to it. Uh, others weren't so. But who gets to be listened to? Is it the folks who are most immediately impacted, or is it the broader community? And again, that's something we should be talking about. We have to have a ways to make these decisions. But it's like there's no way. The council does whatever it wants, and away we go. I mean, the public is just completely out of the picture. Oh, but they, well, they aren't completely out of the picture because they come down, they speak. Uh, sometimes at some of these hearings you'll have... There was one, there was over 100 people. I think that was the Truth Center on, on 4th Street. I think it attracted 100 people over two nights. And at the end of the day, uh, well, actually, it was, uh, well, it got approved. It sure did. I saw an ad in the paper today. <laughs> They're selling them, like, uh, for a million who knows what. Which is another issue in terms of the developments that do go in. Who do they cater to? The high-end, you know, million plus? Or do they cater to? And I don't want to fault anybody on city council. I'm just saying that this is the way it is, and it, it's got to be more democratic. John, we're out of time. Okay, well, thank you for having me. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to the Citizens Forum. Uh, I have with me today Michael J. Carpenter. He uh, received his uh, PhD at the Department of Political Science at the University of Victoria in 2017. His dissertation focused on the theory and practice of civic struggle also known as nonviolent direct action, civil resistance, and people power, especially in the context of the Middle East and in the Palestinian situation in particular. Now, this alternative approach to struggle has manifested in numerous social movements around the world and has demonstrated the potential to substitute for armed strategies and tactics in conflict settings. Michael's thesis explored the neglected question of how resistance movements organize. He argues that the bottom-up, community-based forms of participation and decision-making are the most effective and sustainable civic action. Michael recently conducted research with a grassroots popular resistance movement in the occupied Palestinian territories, examining their methods of actions and forms of organization through interviews, surveys, and embedded observation. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. So I think the first thing we should ask is, what is life like today for Palestinians living under Israeli occupation? Okay, thank you. That's a really good question. And it's become worse and worse over the years and the decades. 
I was there for a few months in 2010, and I was there as well for a few months in 2013, 2014. And I think sometimes it can be useful to first distinguish, because there can be some confusion about what life is like for Palestinians, depending on which Palestinians you're talking about. So what I, what I find useful usually is to first distinguish um, maybe between three different categories of, that Palestinians fall under or three different regimes that they live under. On the one hand, you have the refugees. So you have this mass of millions of Palestinian refugees who uh, have never been resettled or returned to their homes since the founding of Israel in 1948. So on the Where one hand, find those people at mostly? well, so so the refugees are scattered mostly across the Arab world. You've yeah. got refugee camps from Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. Um, the occupied territories have a lot of refugee camps as well. Uh, so so the refugees are one class that Palestinians find themselves under. And another category that Palestinians live under, quite different, is the Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, sometimes called the Arab Israelis or the Arab citizens of Israel, or the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And this is a much smaller number of Palestinians. It's a minority of Israel, and it's about, about a fifth of the population of the Israeli citizenry is Palestinian citizens. And it's important to point this out, because this, these Palestinians living in Israel proper are full citizens on paper. They do have voting rights, they can travel, they can run in elections, they have representation in the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, they can travel relatively freely. And the third class that I think we need to focus on is those living under military occupation. And the, these are the Palestinians, some four million Palestinians living in the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, East Jerusalem. These are the territories that have been occupied for 50 years since 1967. These Palestinians have no rights, no vote in any uh, capacity. They can't travel. Their lives are governed by martial law, by Israeli martial law. They're tried in Israeli military courts. They're detained without, oft, activists are often detained without charge. And they're subject to a whole range of human rights violations on a regular basis, not only by the Israeli military, but by some of the most extremist settler, Israeli settler groups who are living in these settlements in the occupied territories, which as you know, are illegal under, under international law. And I just want to say that I think that distinguishing between those three categories is so important because I've seen so many confusions when people are talking about the Palestinian yeah. issue. And then somebody will say, well, hold on, what are you talking about? Occupation and human rights violations. Palestinians run in Israeli elections and they, yeah. they, they become successful <laughs> business people and, and they're, they're, they're full citizens, they're equal before the law. Well, okay, you're talking about the Israeli citizens, yeah. the Palestinians in Israel, and certainly they have it better. Um, I, and I wouldn't say that they have it uh, uh, an ideal situation either. I think that their situation inside of Israel mostly, uh, we could draw parallels to the indigenous situation here in Canada. Yeah. Technically legal on paper, but carrying the scars and the wounds of all kinds of historical dispossession and colonization. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's complex. And I, I mean, you're probably uh, asking people just to point out where is Israel on the map, but half the people probably don't know how to do that. So as we get into these, these intricacies, it's, it's uh, so important, I think, for especially people who are active in, in these issues to really learn how to differentiate. So let's boil this down and talk about the West Bank. And in the West Bank, there's uh, something known as a, as a popular resistance. So how does that play out in this idea of nonviolent uh, civil disobedience or whether, what you call it? Sure. Well, this is really the intersection of my main two areas of research, which is civil resistance studies on the one hand, understanding the dynamics of civil resistance. This goes back to uh, Gandhi especially and his theory yeah. of nonviolence, picked up by fellows like Gene Sharp, who is another famous proponent of a much more strategic and pragmatic form of nonviolent action. Yeah. And it's really Sharp's approach that I think is applicable in the Palestinian case. Yeah. Because Gene Sharp always emphasized you don't have to be a pacifist to use effective nonviolent action. Yeah. You don't have to hold love in your heart for your opponents yeah. to practice civil resistance. You just have to recognize that it works and use yeah. it for pragmatic reasons. And this is what we find in the history of Palestinian struggle. They have a long, rich, robust tradition of civil protest, civic disobedience, nonviolent action. 
most Palestinians don't conceive of it that way. They just think of it as continuing struggle, politics, resistance, and they often do not differentiate between these categories of violent and nonviolent action. But yeah. nonetheless, we can see that even as Palestinians have a history of armed struggle, they've maintained these parallel and much larger traditions of popular grassroots yeah. nonviolent activism. And we've seen, I mean, um, going back to India and, and with Gandhi and, and uh, the first time I ever was really brought, that idea was brought forward to me, was looking at what they did. And uh, the English uh, regime was fairly brutal. Uh, they were trying to control a massive population, of course. But just that action of just saying, no, we're not going to accept that, but not offering any arms, armed struggle, it put, the, put them in such a poor position that that had to move to something else, that the, if they couldn't oppress them with the, with the guns, then they had to go into negotiation. Gandhi once said, the British have not taken India, we've given it to them. <laughs> that, that, that really all power depends on consent. All yeah. power, all government depends on the consent of the governed. Yeah. So you need to keep the people in line. And similarly, a, a Palestinian nonviolent activist once said, uh, we are under occupation because we choose to be under occupation. Yeah. Now that's a very, it's a rhetorical statement. That's not to say that the Palestinians have asked for or brought the occupation on themselves, but his point was a broader point that we can really do a lot about this if we coordinate mass popular resistance and if not end the occupation, at least put up the most uh, powerful, mount the most powerful challenge that we could to it. That's right, and also they, the Palestinians, have an agenda, promote their agenda. It's fundamentally and morally correct, and uh, in my view, and, and I think those sort of values, because they're such fundamental human values, have so much power, particularly from people from the outside looking in, saying, well, why can't they do these very fundamental things? Why can't they be given just these fundamental rights? And uh, Israel has done well to maintain their agenda. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, over my lifetime, I mean, I've been introduced to this issue back in the, in the 80s. So let's talk about maybe 40 years of this. And I've, what I've seen, and I think you agree, that um, the situation is not static, that in some parts of the occupied territories, it is getting worse and worse. And that's what we don't really understand in the West, that, that how much worse can it get? Well, we really don't know. So I think these things that, the, that you're bringing up is so, so important that perhaps we can turn a corner, perhaps we can find something positive to, to, uh, to uh, hold on to. Now, uh, in the West Bank, uh, there's this, this popular struggle against the wall. Well, could you touch on that issue? Sure, sure. This is where, where, where I think we were, where we were leading with that. But I, I just want to quickly point yeah. out, though, that in all this talk about nonviolent resistance and how Palestinians have become inadvertent experts of traditions of nonviolent struggle, yeah. that I don't want to suggest that um, Palestinian armed struggle is illegitimate. You know, yeah. un under international law, and every Palestinian who practices nonviolent resistance will be the first to tell you it's not because we haven't the right to use arms against Israel. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about suicide bombing or targeting of civilians. I'm talking yeah. about uh, lawful armed struggle. And yeah. the Palestinians are always the first to point out we have that right under international law and under most, I think, moral and ethical codes that uh, tolerate uh, the use of force in self-defense. Yeah. So putting that aside for a moment, in the West Bank, what we saw when Israel began constructing the separation barrier about 15 years ago was a massive upsurge of grassroots popular mobilization along the course of the barrier. Yeah. And the people formed community-based organizations called popular committees to lead these struggles on a community per community basis because they weren't getting help from the Palestinian Authority and they weren't getting help from the international community. And a lot of these pockets of resistance 
um, put up valiant efforts but weren't able to make much of an impact, though there were some that managed to stop the construction of the barrier on their land yeah. or even after the fact had it dismantled and pushed further back away from their land and, and reconstructed uh, uh, off their, off their, their village uh, land. And this movement, this anti-wall movement, continues today and some of the most famous uh, villages involved in this struggle would include the village of Bilin. And maybe you've heard yeah. of the, the documentary called Five Broken Cameras. It was nominated for an Academy Award in 2013, all about the popular struggle. Yeah. But the popular struggle has evolved. It's now no longer just against the wall. A lot of other communities that didn't have the wall passing through their neighborhood saw how it worked, saw how it generated not only global civil society solidarity, which is such an important part, of the yeah. uh, impact and, and, and force of the movement, but also support from progressive Jewish groups from around the world, yeah. including even some from Israel who would come into the territories and put their bodies on the line, marching with the Palestinians because of this format of popular struggle that a lot of people can get behind. Yeah. And one of the most famous villages today that practices it uh, is called Nebi Saleh. And Nebi Saleh, the separation barrier doesn't pass near the village, but they applied the same resistance strategy to the occupation more broadly, to the nearby settlement. Yeah. They launched weekly Friday protests. They began engaging with the international community, Jewish solidarity activists coming yeah. to the village. And this is also the village that uh, the girl Ahed Tamimi, I say girl, a young woman, Ahed yeah. Tamimi, 16 years old, very famously had slapped a, a, and pushed a, a soldier who was trying to enter her property in her village. Yeah. And this was on video, and uh, the, she was, uh, in a few days later, uh, arrested from her home in the middle of the night and spent eight months in prison. This, this uh, young lady became the face of Palestinian struggle for much of the international community and the Palestine yeah. Solidarity Movement because it was a very high-profile incident. And it was very high-profile because one of the essences of this movement is to grow those solidarity connections uh, through civil society, international organizations, uh, and foreign groups of all kinds. So when she was detained, this network, this latent network of support sprang into action. You had news stories, you had social media shared, you had lobbying efforts on her behalf. That's wonderful, Michael. I'm, we're going to have to leave it at there. I hope we can have you back and we can continue to you know, flesh out these issues. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, such an interesting approach, let's say, and I, I think you showed us that these are the sort of things that can happen, even in a, an incredibly oppressive uh, situation. And uh, it gives us a little bit of hope that maybe something good can happen. So uh, that uh, wraps up this segment of Citizens Forum. Have you noticed the huge oil shipments that pass through BC's waters every week? American corporations are sending these hushed shipments to Alaska, and the Canadian government is giving them a free pass to traverse BC's inside passage near our coastal communities, coming within 20 meters from shore. The industry calls them articulated tug barges, ATBs, or pusher tugs. Others call them rule breakers or ghost tankers. Like ghosts, they slip through loopholes in Canada's safety regulations because they are smaller than super tankers. They operate in the shadows, carrying anything from heavy crude oil, diesel, to volatile cancer-causing chemicals like benzene. But it's hard to find out what dangerous oil products they're carrying. This makes it impossible to create good oil spill response plans. ATBs are not designed for the dangerous conditions of BC's west coast, yet Transport Canada says they don't need escort tugs or local pilots like other tankers do. Remember when the Nathan E. Stewart ran aground on BC's coast in 2016? The Nathan E. Stewart was an ATB. It spilled more than 100,000 litres of diesel into the sensitive marine environment. Our government's oil spill response was an utter failure. The Heltzik people are still dealing with the consequences of this spill. A spill from a fully loaded barge could release a third of the volume of oil that spilled in the Exxon Valdez disaster, which would be devastating for our coastal communities. 
These oil shipments do not service BC communities and they put our entire coastline at risk. We owe it to the salmon, whales, and ourselves to defend BC's coast from this risk. Tell Canada's transport authorities to stop giving dangerous ATBs a free pass. For more information, visit sierraclub.bc.ca slash stop ATBs. Welcome back. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every couple of weeks. Um, I guess this segment is Kayla Brent and she's working with the Green Party on proportional representation and that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, so Kayla, what is proportional representation? I think people are starting, but a lot of people still don't know. Yeah, no, it's a slow process. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all, Jack. Um, so proportional representation, uh, it's the term we use to refer to any voting system that determines the amount of seats uh, people get in the or the parties get in the legislature uh, by the amount of total votes they receive in the province. So uh, currently we operate under a first past the post system. Uh, and what this means is that uh, the votes are calculated in your individual ridings and the party with the most votes uh, does not have to pass 50%, just normally it's around a 30 to 40% ratio will get that seat and that happens in you know ridings across the province and that makes up uh, what our legislature looks like. So this ends up being that a lot of the times governments under first past the post um, have they, the party in power has power as a result of only acquiring between 30 and 45 percent uh, of the popular vote which obviously is problematic when you think about you know the other 65 to 70 percent of people who did not vote for that party. Um, so what proportional representation does is it calculates all the votes that were taken in the province. So for example, in our last election, um, the Greens had about 15% of the vote and there was around 35 on each side of the Liberal and NDP. Um, then what happens is proportionally the parties are given those seats. So we see a legislature that more reflects uh, the diversity of British Columbia and truly the will of British Columbians. So if we would have had PR in the last election, the Greens actually would probably have 12 or 13 seats, not the three they have. Yeah. And that's what they deserve because based on the number of votes they actually got, they should have 12 or 13 seats. But our voting system cheats smaller. It doesn't cheat the parties, it cheats the voters. Um, and it happens everywhere and all the time. In the, for example, Alberta uh, shouldn't really have an NDP government. Yeah. People there voted for a wild rose, I'm sorry, a conservative wild rose coalition. They got around 52 or 53 percent of the vote. The Green, uh, the NDP got 40 percent. Mm -hmm. But because they were one party instead of two, they won the most seats. And so Alberta doesn't, and same with Ontario, yeah. where, where Doug Ford has a majority government, but the Greens, I'm sorry, the Liberals, NDP, and Greens have 57% of the vote. So it's all a little bit crazy. To me, I like PR because I think it's more democratic. It gives people more of a voice, and it gives the power structure a little bit less of a voice. And to me, that's good. Um, you want to talk a bit about the referendum? Yeah, for sure. So um, the nice thing is we have a referendum coming up on this exact issue. And it's, you might have just started to hear about it. Uh, it's going to be on October 22nd to November 30th. It's a mail-in ballot, so that means uh, according to your address that you've registered with Elections BC, they'll be mailed to you on October 22nd. Um, from then until November 30th, you'll have the chance to uh, mail it in. Um, so one th important thing is that you, if you haven't yet registered as a voter before, if you've just turned 18 or you know haven't had the chance before to vote, um, then you need to make sure you register online because this is a mail-in ballot. Um, so what this means is that without registering, you won't receive it. Um, and yeah, the ballot uh, is going to look pretty simple. Uh, there's two questions on it. The first being, uh, would you like to stick to the status quo and use our first past the post system, which we currently operate under, or would you like to switch to a proportional voting system? Simple. Uh, then they have a second question, which asks you if you would like to adopt proportional representation, 
uh, which of these following three systems would you like to use? Uh, and the nice thing about this is you can select one, you can rank three, you can rank two. Uh, you don't even have to vote for the second question if you don't want to. Um, so the options you have are MMP, which has been used in several other countries, including New Zealand, and the other two uh, is DMP, which is dual member proportional, and uh, rural urban proportional, which were actually made in BC for BC uh, through some surveys done by the government last fall. And those two systems are not that different from other systems that are also used around no, the world. No, no. Yeah. And all three systems give us our own directly elected MLA, just like we have now. Mm -hmm. And all three systems are very proportional. So if a party gets 10% of the votes, they're going to get 10% of the seats. And if they get 40% of the vote, they're going to get 40% of the seats, not more than 50% and majority government. We'll end up with coalition governments probably all the time, which is going to be good. Um, it's going to be, it, it'll be very interesting. Uh, a lot of good things are going to happen. Now okay. the no side is telling us to be afraid, mm -hmm. um, but don't trust the no side. The no side, I think, is financed by big money and they don't want us to change because proportional representation is more democratic mm -hmm. and that's the last thing they want. That's what they're really afraid of. Um, what are some of the benefits of pro rep? Yeah, so you kind of went over it a little bit already, but some of the benefits I see to switching to a proportional system is kind of what you mentioned, the collaborative nature of a pro, pro rep government. So what that means is we would likely have more minority governments, but this, like you said, reflects the will of the people. Um, and what this means is that a party doesn't have 100% of the power, they can't push through legislation just by the means of having that power. They have to work together, they have to collaborate, they have to compromise. Um, people have to be heard. People that were voted into the legislature by British Columbians will have their voices heard, will be able to discuss their views. Um, and it's going to end up, you know, we're going to see a lot more action on things that matter to everyone. We're going to see a lot more diversity, which is excellent. Um, you know, in other countries that have used proportional representation, we've seen better action on climate change, better action on housing affordability. And this is due to just the collaborative better nature. Better healthcare systems. Better healthcare systems, you yeah. You can see why they, why they don't a, want it. You can yeah. see why they don't want it and can't, the, the people at the top. They don't want any of that stuff. Yeah. No, you can make a long list of, you know, the benefits of proportional representation. And, you know, this is why we're so excited for it. We're excited to see better action on all these files. Um, and this is why I'm passionate about it. Uh, what's the Las Vegas line right now about uh, which way it's going to go? <laughs> um, well, my personal opinion is that it, it will go through. Um, and that's not just because I'm voting for it myself. Um, in the last referendum, we've had a referendum on this issue before, uh, we actually acquired 59% of the 57. vote. 57. 57, yeah, sorry. In the first one, yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, normally it would be a 50% plus one situation. So, uh, you know, as soon as we're over 50% for yes, then the system would be adopted. Uh, in this case, however, there was a 60% threshold and the referendum results were choose to be ignored then. Uh, this case, uh, in the 2018 referendum, it is a 50% plus one uh, case. So technically, according to past referendums, we've already reached that level. We already have that support. So I really am looking forward to it and I think we have a pretty good shot at making this thing happen. Um, what, there's, there's a group called, I can't even remember the name, Vote For, it's, it's the funded group. Um, the, uh, proponent? Yeah. The uh, yes, Vote uh, PRBC. Vote PRBC, yeah. Vote PRBC. If, if you want information, you can go to that website. Um, now they got, I think, half a million dollars. Both sides got half a million dollars each. Yeah. I haven't really seen a lot from them. Are they, are they doing stuff? Yeah, so Vote PRBC is our main proponent, and um, from talking with people who are working with the, in that organization, uh, I heard it was more intended to be a campaign closer to the date of the referendum. So oh. I've seen a bit more from them now, and I think that it just intends to ramp up uh, to the you know day the referendum begins and then onwards through it. Um, I think a lot of groups kind of started off early to make sure people were engaged and getting informed um, before the rush, but. I think Vote PRBC is kind of leaving that job to everyone else and then just is going to really campaign hard uh, as we get into the next few weeks. 
Um, proportional representation is not going to solve all our problems, that's for sure. But it does give people more of a voice. And it's less easy for the media to control the outcome because very often what you see happen in, a, in an election in Canada, you have two parties that are about 30, 35 percent of the vote a couple of months before, and then the media, often through supporting one party or creating a scandal in the other party, pushes one party up to 40. And that 40 or 41 percent is almost always all it takes to get a majority government. So it really gives the media a lot of power to control who becomes our government. But with, with PR, that won't happen at all. If you get 40% of the vote, you're going to get 40% of the seats. And the other 60%, maybe they want to come together and create the government. So it will solve a lot of problems. It gets rid of, um, what do they call it, when you have to... You have to um, you want to vote for party A, but you end up voting for party C because you hate party B. I uh, called it a few things. I think negative voting or plug nose voting. Those yeah. are some of the names there's I've a, heard. <laughs> yeah, we won't have to do as much of that. That'll, that'll be gone. Mm -hmm. um, so those are reasons I like PR. What are some of the other reasons you like it? Um, you know, there's quite a few I could probably go on about, but kind of from the, the youth perspective, it really intrigues me because I see a lot of people um, my age, younger, older, feeling very disenfranchised by the system. They feel that, you know, well, my vote doesn't matter. Why would I go out there? Because, you know, I live in a community where, whether it's Liberal, NDP, or Green, but I'm not represented in that. That's not what I like. Why would I go vote? I have no chance. Because they know their riding maybe isn't a swing riding where, you know, parties need to campaign hard. They kind of, you know, accept it as a given. That's a given seat. They're going to win that. Um, so a lot of youth don't go out and vote. They kind of push themselves away from the democratic process and just ignore it as something that's not really relevant to them or that they're not able to influence. And I think under proportional representation, that will be, you know, put aside a little bit. People will start to feel, you know, every vote does count. Every vote goes towards the makeup of our legislature. When I go out there and vote, I know that I'm going to be represented by the people in there, by the nature that, um, you know, I contributed to the popular vote and that's what excites me. I've talked to a lot of people whether on campus or through my work with the Green Party or through Fair Vote. Um, this really excites people when they know they can go in not strategically vote, not plug their nose while they vote, but just vote for what they want and know and trust that that will count for something. Do you think most young people are supporting PR? I, I really do. From my discussions with people just saying you know this is the reality of our current system and here's an alternative and you know people have went back done their research and said yeah this is right for me that you know this is how I feel as a young person in British Columbia and this lines up with them this lines up with their goals with their values and people are really starting to get behind it and I've already seen it a lot on campus and throughout BC. I would urge everybody to vote for proportional representation Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's more democratic. I think it's a better system. It's going to give us a chance, at least, for some kind of a future because the current system doesn't work. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's the Walton Jack Show. It is Wednesday, September 26th. I'm just going to start. Well, why don't you start off with one and then I'll follow up. Well, gosh, you know, you, you had, you had okay, such a I'll good start, one. Okay, I'll start off with that? this one. Um, this is from Fair Vote Canada, which is uh, w one of the groups that supports PR voting. Um, it says, Saturday, we launched a proportional representation fact checker site. Two of Canada's top electoral reform experts will evaluate the claims made by both sides in BC's referendum. Personally, I have a lot of trouble with some of the claims made by the no side. And I'm sure there are things from the yes side as well. So here were a couple of people who, yes, they were connected to the yes side, but at least it's a place where people can go and try to get maybe some uh, objective evidence about the claims. I mean, people are saying, you know, it, it, believe me, the, the people who do not want proportional representation, I think, do not want it because it's more democratic, because it will give us more of a voice. And those people play to win. 
So you just have to check their facts. If their facts are right, then I've got no problem with them saying them. So on Saturday, Fair Vote Canada set up this proportional representation fact checker site. Within hours, the site had slowed down. By Sunday, it was failing to load. It's now been confirmed by our technical specialists that the fact check site was attacked by someone trying to shut us down by overwhelming the site with 80,000 page requests. Today is Wednesday. I don't think it's back working. So that's, I mean, that's not even news. You know, here in this referendum of the utmost importance, a, 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 a website has been shut down that, you know, hopes to shed some light on this. And there's nothing in the media. The media is too, yeah, can't be bothered. And it's not any website. These are major players in the, in the debate. These yes. are the voices that we deserve to hear. We don't have to agree with, with whatever we're reading, but we do, we should have a chance to hear these views. And, to, and if people want to check the facts, I think it's a great way to do it. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So where we are right now, where, this, this is going to start showing around the beginning of October. Um, there's going to be a mail-in ballot. Everybody will be sent a ballot. Um, the vote will take place between October 22nd and November 30th, approximately. It's a mail-in ballot. Two questions, yes or no, do you want to change our voting system, this one or this one? And then you can choose if you want to between the three systems. And I think all the three systems are pretty good. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's set up quite well. And I, if, if uh, we have the, the government of British Columbia who profess that they're being really propon proponents for this, if they really come out and really make an effort, other than just a, a sort of, a, a, you know, some kind of faint sort of praise for the system, I think they should really be taking extraordinary steps right now to, to get the facts out and get the public to come out and vote. Yes. It's, it's a hope, a chance for the future. I mean, the way things are going now are not good. Uh, I think a more democratic voting system will, will give us more of a voice. And I think if people have more of a voice, things will get better. I brought one in. I didn't bring any article in. I just saw it online, Jack. We should talk about the New Brunswick vote. Oh, yes, Just yes, for yes. two or three minutes, because it's, it's very similar to what happened in British Columbia. And the New Brunswick vote was two nights ago. Two nights ago, the provincial election. Uh, the Liberals are, are just hanging on to power barely, almost with the exact same situation we had here in British Columbia, where they had to reach out and uh, are, are reaching out to, to form some kind of uh, an agreement with the Green Party, who won three seats. Uh, so there's some complications there because there's another independent party that has three seats that is traditionally more leaning towards the Conservatives. Uh, however, with the way things happen, with the Speaker of the House gets chosen and all that, it's very, very uncertain. Nobody's going to end up with a majority. So uh, just took a look at the, the, the numbers very briefly. And what, I, what struck me was uh, that uh, the Conservatives, uh, who won 31.9% of the vote, 31.9% of the vote, and they're claiming they have legitimacy to run the government. Now, they got 6% less vote than the Liberals. Six the Liberals got more less. votes. But the Liberals had 37.8% uh, vote. So we have... And f one fewer seat. They have one fewer seat. The Liberals have one fewer seat. But nevertheless, if you look at it, the Conservatives uh, won a seat for every 1.3% of the vote, uh, where the Liberals had to get 1.8% of the vote to win a seat. And if you go further down, the NDP at 5%, no wins. The Greens had 11.9% and they won three seats, which means they had to have 4% of uh, the vote per seat. Right. And the People's Alliance is in the new party in British Columbia. In they also uh, won three seats and uh, around 13% of the vote. So very interesting what happened in, in uh, New Brunswick. Uh, we're seeing, hearing the same old things about how uncertain it all is and Nobody's in power, and it's all supposed to fall apart, but we know differently. We know that these governments operate very, very well when they're in minority situations. Most of the progressive things that ever happened in this country came from minority governments, 
And uh, matter of fact, the, the vote on proportional representation was a major, major plank in the Green Party's uh, platform. Which in they, New Brunswick? In, in, oh, in British Columbia. In, oh. Oh, no, yes, in, 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 in New Brunswick, they didn't have that. They didn't. They weren't pushing for that issue. So it's going to be hard for them to turn around and say, "Okay, you want our support? We want proportional representation." But it's not an alien idea down there either. The the Brunswick uh, population is uh, where where I'm from, and I there's a lot of disenchantment, a lot of feeling of stagnation in politics there for the last 30 or 40 years, and. Uh, People are really looking for something to change down there. Yeah, boy, we sure need some change. We need a breath of fresh air. We need, I think we need more democracy. Yeah. Which is just what people want. I mean, give us a <laughs> voice. We're just getting killed here. The, the 1% runs everything. Well, you have a conservative government that wins 31.9% of the vote, and they're claiming they won the election and they should have the chance to rule. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a problem. Yeah, when the party that got 37.8% of the vote, which is still not that much, has fewer seats. Yeah. Well, that's the, same, that's the situation that's happened in Canada and the United States in the last 30 or 40 years that we've all seemed to just kind of let it, let it happen. Well, it's just not fair. Yes. You know, the majority of the population is putting up with a government which they did not vote for. You know. And even the ones who did vote for them, they're not getting what they want either. No. I mean, it, it's just <laughs> pathetic. I mean, take, take Christy Clark and the Liberals. A lot of people voted for Christy Clark and the Liberals because they're the ones who profess to be the ones who will take wise care of the economy and protect the yeah. economic stability of the, of the, for the future. That's their line. Yeah. And a lot of people believe that. But they loaded us up with $50 billion worth of debt that nobody has ever heard of. I mean, it's yeah. just off in the corner somewhere. The media won't talk about it. The NDP won't even talk about it. But the liberals who, you know, the, were taking care of the economy, $50 billion worth of long-term contracts to buy electrical power from private corporations that have wrecked our rivers in order to get this power that we don't need and we can't sell. I mean, that's the good business. And, and then the NDP says we're taking care of the environment, which is an equally big joke. <laughs> so we need lots of change. <laughs> we certainly do. Now, let's talk about the storm in uh, the re most recent storm in the Carolinas in the United yes. States. Yes. Because I, we, I think we both agree the coverage, although a bit sensational, hasn't really looked at some of the fundamental long term damage that's occurring in, in that area. That we we're now into two or three weeks of flooding. I think it's instance. two weeks. It's getting worse. It's getting, here we are, it's, uh, it's September 26th. The flooding is supposed to be peaking in many places in the next couple of days. Massive, massive damage, environmental catastrophe, thousands and thousands, uh, huge areas flooded, crops, animals, massive deficit. And, and it's like it's not happening. You, you watch the news, you, you, you listen to CBC, CTV, CNN, MSNBC. Yeah. It's just not there. It's all being, it, they just won't talk about it. It's t I think it's, it must be the biggest, I would say the biggest environmental catastrophe in my lifetime, yeah. aside from the wars which they, which they do. But Yeah, there's a satellite image, not a satellite image, but a, 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 a wide shot from a plane looking at uh, the rivers running into the Gulf of Mexico. They're black. Yeah. Do you see black oil slicks running out into the ocean. So you can imagine what's in that water. You can imagine how deadly that water is right now. And a lot of that water backs up into these bayous and these places. It stays there forever. You know, it's, it's, it's a very, very low-lying piece of land. Now, the one thing I did check out today was uh, if there was any nuclear power plants in the region. I'm sure there's, of course there is, and, and one is flooded right now. Not a word about that. Yeah, they just, nothing. So, uh, the f yeah, so we don't have a meltdown going on like in Fukushima, but what are we talking about here? How close are we to a disaster there? What, what steps should they be taking? Nothing's being said about that. And this is only the beginning. Yeah. Um, climate change is, so we've got to change. And the way we have to change is we have to use less and drive less and consume less and probably have better lives because of it. Exactly. You want to talk a bit about KM? Well, uh, or I, anything else. I think what we should also mention here is that I brought in one clip. You've got time for this? 
We have about a minute and a half. And this is uh, in the business section. 22 which... week National Energy Board redo ordered on Trans Mountain Review. Okay, so the courts have decided that the government has not done their job. Basically, they're saying that the National Energy Board review, which we're all aware of how that went, is such a sham. Now they're being, they're being sent back out to do it again. Now, Jack, what do you think? What are the, ch the chances are that the Liberals are going to say, oh, that's good enough and we're going to go ahead now? Well, I think that's the, exactly the plan. Yeah. So, I mean, where's the fairness in that? You know, uh, uh, they just got to go out for another 22 weeks and pretend to listen and then go ahead. And then the courts will say, okay. Yeah. I think that's anyway. Uh, but this stuff is all totally insane because the Carolinas are flooded. We just had a tornado in Ottawa, of all places. Yeah. I mean, and Quebec. There's, I don't think there's ever been anything like that. In, I haven't, in my life, I don't ever remember that. I don't remember that. either. There are, has been tornadoes in Ontario, but nothing this size in, in, in residential neighborhoods. So we have to change, and we're out of time. Okay. So. Away we go. Thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum, and hopefully in two weeks' time there will still be a planet here. <laughs>